I'm Mark Golub, and in the news continues to be reaction to the Obama administration's apparent embrace of the Fatah Hamas alliance that has created a new Palestinian unity government. Many in the Jewish community are extremely critical of the president, arguing that the U.S. has designated Hamas a terrorist organization and that therefore the U.S. should refuse to deal with any government that includes Hamas and should now be refusing to deal with the Palestinian Authority. And the U.S. is not the only country to recognize the, the, the new unity government. The European Union, China, India have all said they recognize and will work with the new Palestinian unity government. And both Washington and the EU have said the Palestinian government must reject violence and accept Israel's right to exist, which, according to Mahmoud Abbas, his unity government is committed to doing. Israel, on the other hand, is being extremely critical of U.S. policy. Prime Minister Netanyahu has urged the U.S. to make it, quote, absolutely clear, unquote, to Abbas that his pact with Hamas is simply unacceptable. So what is the significance of the Fatah Hamas alliance? Does it pose any real threat to Israel? And has the United States betrayed one of her most important allies, the state of Israel, by engaging with the new Palestinian unity government? Well, for some answers to these complex and extremely important questions, we're most pleased to have on our phones from Washington right now one of this country's foremost Middle East experts, Aaron David Miller, Vice President for New Initiatives at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Aaron served for some two decades at the Department of State as an advisor to both Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State, where he helped formulate U.S. policy on the Middle East and specifically the Arab-Israeli peace process. And he's the author of several books on the Middle East, including his 2008 book entitled The Much Too Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for Arab-Israeli Peace. And Aaron, thank you so much for joining us again. Pleasure to be here. So, Aaron, has the United States done anything wrong by saying that it recognizes the Fatah Hamas unity government and is willing to fund the Palestinian Authority even with Hamas in it? Well, there were three options. One is to adopt a very tough-minded response and to basically argue that even while there are no Hamas ministers and uh, Mahmoud Abbas's letter announcing the government <clears throat> basically claims that these particular collections of of ministers under his auspices except the quartet's condition, including recognition of Israel. <clears throat> Despite all that, the United States could have taken the position that this is this government, technocratic though it is, is essentially a creature, however dependent and, and weak a creature, uh, of a Fatah Hamas uh, putative unity arrangement. So it could have taken the position that um, we're not going to have anything to do with it. That would have been one option. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, a second option uh, is to essentially em embrace it uh, fully uh, and, um, you know, raise no concerns. This is not going to be wait and see. Uh, that, in, in essence, uh, the U.S. has no doubts whatsoever that this government is committed to uh, recognizing Israel, a negotiated solution, uh, and it's essentially business as usual. Or third, and in government, you usually look for the middle option. It's usually the safest in terms of securing all of your equities, is to basically do what they've done, which is to basically say, there are no Hamas ministers in this government. We'll adopt a wait-and-see attitude. We want to maintain contacts with Abbas. And let's be clear what we're talking about. First of all, <clears throat> there's no recognition of this government. We, didn't even, we, we don't recognize the Palestinian Authority. There is a PLO, quote-unquote, ambassador in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, and that individual is, is attached to the PLO. So we don't recognize the government of Palestine as an established state because it's not a state. So when we talk about recognition, we're talking about maintaining contact, number one, and our consul general in Jerusalem will continue to meet with Mahmoud Abbas mm -hmm. and, uh, and the deputy ministers or the ministers representing um, any number of, uh, of, uh, of 
you know, Palestinian Authority ministers, probably as if it was business as usual. The aid will probably, unless Congress tries to impose restrictions, which they may well do, the aid will probably continue to be dispersed. And the Obama administration will continue to watch and wait to see whether or not this government behaves in an unusual fashion. For example, if Hamas rockets are launched into Israel, what is the position of this new government going to be? I mean, I think it puts the administration, the third option, which they've adopted, puts the administration in a very tricky position. I know why they did it, because they want to maintain options. Mm -hmm. They want to maintain context. And look, let's be clear, in the world, in the real world, forget the world of political rhetoric, in which presidents and, and American presidents and Israeli prime ministers often live, the reality is the Israelis have no stake in seeing the United States cut off all aid to the Palestinians. The Israelis have no stake in seeing um, security, their own security cooperation with elements of Fatah on the West Bank um, undermined. They will continue those things. And I suspect that um, um, they will reluctantly and grudgingly accept the reality mm-hmm. that rather than accelerate the collapse of a very weak Palestinian authority, they probably will want to see it survive. So... Israelis will have to make a certain amount of accommodation with this new entity. I think, though, that this, this discussion misses the broader point, which is what is the purpose of unity? And here, I take a very tough-minded view of this situation. This, this unity agreement, the fourth effort, which has now gone further, of course, than any of its previous efforts, is driven by the relative weakness of both Hamas on one hand and Fatah on the other. You say yeah, it's Hamas weak. Is, I'm sorry, Aaron. You say that the Palestinian Authority is weak, and that's why it entered into this unity government. I, I think Fatah. Forget the Palestinian Authority for a minute. It is a creature of of Fatah, yes. dominated by Fatah, created by Fatah. Hamas and Fatah have come to this arrangement out of a position of weak. Each Hamas one. is well. Hamas is uh, under pressure for bad governance in Gaza. They are running out of money. The uh, Egyptian military's uh, coup or not coup, however you want to describe it, last year against Mohamed Morsi, uh, has removed a very important ally. The Egyptian government has acted to close uh, the vast majorities of the tunnels. They are clamping down on um, uh, smuggling operations, including con- con- contraband and weapons to Hamas. So Hamas needs a lifeline. Mm-hmm. Abbas, on the other hand, uh, is also, it seems to me, in a very weak position. He's just participated in a 10-month uh, U.S.-sponsored peace process, which has now all but collapsed. The Palestinian economy is not doing well. He has failed to produce a Palestinian state. He has stayed his hand in terms of taking the Palestinian issue, issue to the U.N. again, uh, or promoting actively a policy of isolating Israel abroad, not that he won't he won't act on that at some point, but he has essentially toned that down. He, too, just like Hamas, is reacting to the reality that on the Palestinian street, so-called unity is a very popular and resonant issue. And they come to it, both of them, in my judgment, out of a, a policy of weakness. That's number one. Number two, if this unity was directed at achieving one gun, one authority, one negotiating position. Yes. Meeting the quartet's condition of recognizing Israel, respecting all previous agreements, and renouncing violence. If, in fact, at the end of a unity process, you ended up with one Palestinian leader who controlled all of the guns of Palestine, who was capable of reuniting the West Bank and Gaza, and who was prepared to unmistakably with the broad Palestinian national movement behind him, enter into a negotiation with Israel, you would have removed, on the Palestinian side, one of the most profound concerns that the United States and Israel has about the current situation. Because right now, the Palestinian national movement looks like Noah's Ark. (laughs) There are two of everything. Mm -hmm. Two constitutions, two visions of Palestine, two sets of security services. Right now, Hamas maintains own independence, 
It, re- it retains high-trajectory weapons, missiles, and rockets, which have grown increasingly accurate and lethal and precise. None of that is going to be addressed by this unity agreement, mm-hmm. which brings me to my final point. I think Hamas's objective is very clear. They are determined, it seems to me, uh, in part because they are weak, to adopt a model much along the lines of Hezbollah, which is to retain their military capacity and yet work within the structures of a political establishment to, in a way, to, in a way, increase their influence on the West Bank and within the Palestinian Authority over time. This is not going to happen quickly over time, at the expense of Abbas and Fatah. So it seems to me that the whole enterprise, the unity enterprise, is flawed and, in my judgment, in a way quite worrisome. I'm, I'm much less concerned about the Obama administration's you know, purported efforts to keep its contacts with the Palestinian Authority. I mean, we're not going to embrace Hamas. We're not going to recognize Hamas. We're not going to that Hamas is suddenly not a terrorist organization. I just hope that when and if elections take place within the next six to eight months for a new Palestinian parliament uh, and presidential election, that we, we insist to the degree that we are perceived to be credible on candidacy requirements. That is to say that no one runs mm-hmm. unless they renounce violence mm-hmm. and terror. We didn't do that. Excuse me, the Bush administration did not do that in 2006. They believed wrongly that sponsoring free and fair elections in Palestine would result in uh, the uh, a victory for what they considered to be the good Palestinians. Yes. The non-Arafat Palestinians. Well, he was dead by then, but Mahmoud Abbas, it didn't turn out that way mm-hmm. at all. In fact, when free and fair elections are held in the Arab Muslim world these days, the Islamists usually do very well. Mm-hmm. They're the least corrupt, they're the most organized, <laughs> and they're the most disciplined. Yes. It, it was true in Iraq, it was true in, it was true in Egypt under Morsi, uh, and uh, uh, it was, it's been true in Lebanon, and it was true in, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. So, I, I, again, I think the unity gambit is fundamentally flawed, uh, and ultimately not going to result in better governance uh, on the, over the West Bank and Gaza, and it is not, in my judgment, going to accelerate uh, the pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace. Okay, then I need you to clarify for the audience. I want you to tell me again, if you were still working with the State Department or in some way you were advising the President of the United States on the one hand, or Aaron, what if you were in the inner circle of the Israeli Prime Minister? And all of a sudden, this announcement is made. What would you want the President of the United States to say and do? What would you want the Prime Minister of Israel to say and do? Well, I, I, I think I would have expressed more profound concerns about the purpose of unity if I were the President of the United States. Uh, I'm, I was actually a little surprised that they came out so quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I would, in the case of either the President and the, or the Israelis, Say nothing that that I would ultimately contradict in a month a month from now. And you and might the, and you and you will know you might have to contradict something if it was said the way it was been it has been said by the American administration in the last seven days. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, I th- I think they will watch and wait. Uh, they will look, and they're going to have to measure the the look. This government, you cannot you cannot in all good conscience adopt the view that just because there are no Hamas ministers in this government, that all of a sudden, poof, yes. the government was born in, through some process of immaculate conception, yes. and that Hamas has nothing to do with it. I mean, it, this, this government is an expression of a Fatah-Hamas unity deal. There may be no Hamas ministers in it. Abbas may be the one who, who fundamentally controls the resources of this government. But it is an expression. It is a child of a union mm-hmm. between Fatah and Hamas. And, you know, the administration uh, and the Israelis will be watching very carefully to see how the child behaves. The question becomes, to, just to continue this metaphor a bit longer, if 
one of the parents of this union or of this child, Hamas, continues to espouse rhetoric that is either anti-Semitic, anti-American, or anti-Israeli, or launches rockets into Israel proper, both Abbas and the United States are put in a very difficult position. Mm -hmm. Because how long do you, will you continue to separate out the fact that this government uh, was not a uh, manifestation of an active set of negotiations and, agree and an agreement between Fatah and Hamas. It becomes very, very tricky. Okay, but I have heard again, these, uh, Again, I, at the end, at the end of the day, the Israelis, too, are going to have to figure out how to reconcile their own principles, which is to not deal with Hamas. And by the way, you know, it would not surprise me in the least to learn that, you know, Israeli intelligence, Shin Bet or Shin Bet probably, uh, through cutouts, had maintained any number of contacts with Hamas, either in an effort to, to um, redeem Gilad Shalit in 2011, or to maintain uh, a, a, a ceasefire um, over the last several years. So nobody on this one is, is purer than Caesar's wife. Yes. Uh, that's for sure. Although that's a different quality of relationship, isn't it? Yes, we're not talking about uh, we're not talking about recognition. Exactly. We're not talking about relations. We're not talking about you know negotiating for an agreement. And we understand there are always backdoor conversations going yes, on. Yes, there are. Yeah. The question is, what's the formal policy, and what's the policy stated for the world? And, right. Oh, and what's the purpose? Of yes. The you know, I've so, heard again, you. again, I'm uh, not. I mean, look, I, I you know, mm -hmm. there are. There are, there are, you know, in, in my last book, I have this concept of what I call the cosmic oive. Yes. Cosmic oive is the notion, in some quarters of the Jewish community, anything that is done by the United States that even remotely suggests a difference of opinion with Israel is always interpreted as some kind of crisis. The sky is falling. Um, if there's going to be a ca catastrophe in U.S. Israeli relations. I don't see the world that way. I've watched under Republican and Democratic administrations for 30 years. America commit itself, even with its own divergence of opinion and differing interests, to a relationship with the state of Israel, which has grown increasingly stronger, more resilient. Now, admittedly, you have a president who, unlike his two immediate predecessors, George W. Bush, for whom I worked, and Bill Clinton, for whom I worked, who, in my judgment, is not of that generation. I mean, Barack Obama, let's remember, was six years old during the 1967 war. Six years old. He, he was not a part of a, a seminal series of events which brought America and Israel much closer together. He functioned in a world for most of his adult life in which being good on Israel, quote-unquote, was really not necessary or terribly relevant. And if you combine that with his emotional detachment, he doesn't have the same sort of instinctive pro-Israeli sentiment and feeling that Bill Clinton would have, mm -hmm. who wrote in his memoirs that I, Bill Clinton wrote, and I quote, I loved Rabin as, a, as I had loved no man, or George W. Bush's res profound respect and admiration for Ariel Sharon, a man with whom he, he still had differences. But as governor of Texas, flying over Israel's narrow waist with yeah. your own in the helicopter, Bush blurts out, we got driveways in Texas, Mr. Minister, longer than this country is wide. Mm -hmm. That comment on the precariousness of Israel's security situation comes from the gut, from the heart. It's not an analytical comment. It's an emotional comment. But and you're saying all that, that same said, emotion All is... that said, Barack Obama is not an enemy of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. He's not profoundly anti-Israel, nor is the U.S.-Israeli relationship right now, uh, you know, passing through a great moment of catastrophic, catastrophic, crisis, catastrophic crisis. And by the way, if there is a crisis in the U.S.-Israeli relationship, it's not going to be on the Palestinian issue. It'll be on the other issue. What to do about Iran's putative efforts to acquire a nuclear weapons capacity. And by the way, the most important date that is looming, it has nothing to do with the issue we're talking about. 
it's July 20, the, the first date by which an interim agreement, excuse me, a comprehensive agreement yes. between the P5 plus one and Iran is to be reached. Watch that. Or if you're concerned about the U.S.-Israeli relationship, watch that date mm-hmm. and see what happens to the, uh, the diplomacy that we're currently running with the Iranians. Okay, Aaron, you've given me some sense of how you analyze the American response and what you wish it were. Now, I also want to hear you talk about the Israeli response. You know, the Israel Housing Ministry issued a response to the formation of the Palestinian Unity Government by authorizing the building of 1,500 new housing units on the east side of the Green Line. Almost half of those 1,500 units are to be built in the suburban communities surrounding Jerusalem, such as Efrat and the Etzion Bloc. And everyone agrees they'll be part of Israel in any two-state solution. Then roughly 400 units are to be built in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Ramat Shlomo. Roughly 5% are slated for the West Bank city of Ariel. And of the 1,500 new housing units, only 38 of them are to be built outside what's considered to be major West Bank settlement blocks. Yet... Many have come down very hard, Aaron, against Israel for making this announcement, including former U.S.-Israeli Ambassador Dan Shapiro and Jewish columnist Jeffrey Goldberg. And I wanted to know what your take was on this Israeli response. Well, the Israelis don't need this justification to do something that they are determined to do anyway, which is build in the blocks. And by the way, building in the blocks is of no small comfort to the Palestinians because the size of those blocks... Um, and, their, and their perimeters have not yet been negotiated. But that's, but that's beside the point. The, the fact is, you know, this is like apples and oranges. The, the Palestinians did something the Israelis deeply resent. Mm-hmm. And as a consequence, the Israelis said, fine, you know, you take an action that we don't like, and we're going to take an action that you don't like. But, uh, again, on the issue of building in the areas that you just identified, the Israelis particularly the Ministry of Housing, doesn't need a justification or an, or an excuse to do that. I think you're, you're in, the worrisome piece about all this is that you're into a perspective sort of escalatory cycle where with no longer under any encumbrance mm-hmm. uh, with respect to negotiations or under Kerry's efforts to reach an agreement, you're going to end up with any number of actions by both sides that the other, other party is not going to like. Look, the issue is not settlement. The issue, in my judgment, is, is very clear. The main event, and that is, can this Israeli prime minister and this Palestinian president, under American auspices or not, reach a conflict-ending agreement? Can they, Aaron? On the six core issues that oh. drive the Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah. And my, my, my answer to that question right now, June 5th, we're almost on the eve of the 1967 war. The an- another anniversary is no. Mm-hmm. It's a bridge too far. Mm-hmm. So the question then becomes, if that is the case, if on Jerusalem, refugees, recognition of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, ending, ending conflict and finality of all claims, territories uh, and, and borders and security, if you cannot reach a conflict ending agreement on this, on those issues, what can you do? And if you can't reach any agreement at all, ultimately, how does this relationship, this conflict, continue to evolve? That's the core question. I don't have an answer for you, but perhaps I'll come back and we'll have another conversation. That's fair enough. By the way, should Israel continue to negotiate with this unity government that includes Hamas? You know, the prime minister has already made his views clear. The answer is no. And the worst thing the Israelis just, I would advise my own, I'm not an Israeli, and I don't give advice uh, to Israeli prime ministers, but I am an American, and I, I give advice to an American president. The worst thing this president can do is to make a statement that he's not prepared to live by. When rhetoric exceeds capacity to deliver or commitment to deliver, into that large gap falls American credibility. So if the prime minister of Israel has said, I'm not negotiating, with uh, this uh, Palestinian president, because he's conducted a unity agreement, he ought to stick to it. Mm-hmm. And besides, right now, there's really no, there's no point 
There's no point in going back to the negotiating table only to create another crisis or another set of false hopes and false expectations. Okay. One last question for you, Aaron. Yep. I indicated at the start of our conversation much of your career You've been immersed in American foreign policy regarding this Israeli-Palestinian conflict in general, not for this particular moment in time, but as you look at the sweep of the last six years. How do you assess, given the experience you had in former administrations, how do you assess the Obama administration's record when it comes to supporting the state of Israel? Supporting the state of Israel, its security, its well-being, uh, defending it in international circles, um, creating, creating an impression that, in fact, the United States will stand by Israel, I think I would give this administration pretty high marks in that. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I see it in its broadest sweep. We've, we've been through much greater crises. Yes. I work for a guy, Jim Baker, who I profoundly respect and, and frankly, who did a great deal. Um, mm -hmm. For, for, for advancing American interests and Israeli interests, too. Um, we went through a period of tremendous tension between Bush 41 and Shamir and Baker and Shamir. Tremendous tension. This is not what, what, what you're seeing now between Israel and the United States by, by no means, by no stretch of the imagination, the, the most acute period of tension in this relationship. Eisenhower threatened to sanction the over Suez in, in uh, 1956 and 1957. So there have been crises before. Jimmy Carter and Begin got into it. Even Kissinger got into it with Rabin and threatened to assess the, reassess the uh, U.S.-Israeli relationship in 1975. So these were moments of high drama in the relationship. My point is what remains is not what separates Israel and the United States. What remains is, is what unites the two countries. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is really, I, I think, a, a, a point worth, worth stressing. For a country of 317 million people, on one hand, a country of 8 million people, one who has truly existential fears that are real, Israel, another that, is, that is, has non-predatory neighbors to its north and south, the Canadians and the Mexicans, and fish to its east and west, these two big oceans as neighbors, that does not have an existential threat. The fact that we agree on so much mm -hmm. is truly stunning and remarkable. It's a very and the alliance, one, one final point, the alliance, it's not a formal alliance, but the relationship between the United States and Israel is driven by many things. A, a pro-Israeli community that carries influence, uh, moral debt that the United States believes it owes to the Jewish people in the wake of the Nazi genocide. Uh, Israel's functioning as a strategic ally of the United States. All these things are important. But unless you have this, the fact that Israel and the United States share common values, that from the perception of most Americans, and I'm talking about most non-Jewish Americans, there's a certain closeness because there is the sense that these two countries, however different they may be, share similar values. That is the basis of this of that relationship. Aaron, that's, I, I, that's what you, you must forgive. Me. I only have to interrupt you because I'm grabbed by the clock. Uh, you, are sure. fab, you are fabulous. You know how much I love you, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate your taking time out of a, a very, very busy schedule to share the insight you have with us. Thank you, and we will talk often, my friend. For sure, Michael. Take care, and uh, it's a terrific show. Thank you so much. The thoughts of Aaron David Miller, Vice President for the New Initiatives at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. As always, I ask you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have. I don't have time to put it up on the screen right now. You know how to reach me. My thanks to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, Carol Lilienthal for making this edition of In the News Possible. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. <laughs>